only be found at the intersection of ecology and economics. Following this, the End of Growth Tour was born. Uh, I'd like to tell you first a little bit about each of them. Jeff Rubin is the author of Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller. It is a number one national bestseller and the Canadian Business Book of the Year. Jeff was the Chief Economist and Chief Strategist at CIBC World Markets, where he worked for over 20 years. In his best-selling book, The End of Growth, Jeff Rubin shows us how the end of cheap oil equals the end of growth and the end of easy answers to renewing prosperity. But is it all that bad? Research shows that some of the most contented people on the planet live in places with no growth or slow growth GDPs. Consumption does not guarantee happiness. Good or bad, Jeff writes, the end of growth is the new reality. Our world is not only about to get smaller, our day-to-day -day lives are about to be a whole lot different. David Suzuki, he is an award-winning geneticist and broadcaster. Uh, David is familiar to audiences around the world as host of CBC TV's long-running series, The Nature of Things. From 1963 to 2001, he was a faculty member at the University of British Columbia and he's currently Professor Emeritus. He has authored over 40 books and he's widely recognized as a world leader in sustainable ecology. David has received numerous awards for his work, including a UNESCO Prize for Science, a United Nations Environment Program Medal, and he is also a companion of the Order of Canada. He has 28 honorary doctorates from universities in the USA, Canada, and Australia. In his most recent title, David Suzuki explores the interconnectedness of the world's myriad environmental challenges. The solutions are there, he argues. We just need the will to act together to bring about change. Everything under the sun includes the latest scientific findings and examples of the positive actions that people are taking today <laughs> towards protecting what we have. Underpinning it all is the recognition that Earth gives us everything we require to live, under a sun that provides the energy to produce food, transport, and all of our modern conveniences. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Rubin and Dr. David Sudeikis. Mary, I didn't know you were just going to bugger off. Then. <laughs> so it's Jeff and David show, is it? Anyway, I, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all for coming and uh, and filling the tent. I am so honored to have the opportunity to share the stage with Jeff. I know this is going to be a wonderful tour. He's a man that uh, of of great authority, so I don't have to keep dumping all over economics about which I know nothing. <laughs> Jeff will do it for me. So it's great to be here. You know, I've often been told by politicians and business people that I'm too radical or I demand too much. That in fact, I've got to be realistic because the economy is the bottom line. And this has always puzzled me because it seems to me that they don't understand the very word economy is based on the Greek word ekos, meaning household or domain. Economics is the management of home. Ecology, based on the same word, is the study of home. Ecologists try to determine the principles, the laws, uh, the conditions that enable a species to flourish and survive. Not a bad bit of information, and I would have thought any economist would say, okay, before we do anything, what are those ecologists telling us? Because we don't want to do anything that violate these principles or these laws. But instead, we elevate economics above the very concepts that we understand uh, about survival. You see, the domain, the ecos, the domain of our species, indeed of all species, is the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists. And Carl Sagan told us if we reduce the earth to the size of a basketball, the surface would be smoother than the surface of a billiard ball and the biosphere, where all life exists, would be thinner than a layer of saran wrap. And that's it. That's our home and the home of 
anywhere from 10 to 100 million other species. And it's fixed. It can't grow. And yet one species, us, thinks that we can take it over, use whatever we want, spew our chemicals and toxic waste back into it without paying any price. Well, it can't go on. We can't see the urgent need to see our actions, uh, the consequences of our actions, because I believe we've lost our sense of where we belong and what our home is. Now, I'm a geneticist, and I've been amazed at all of the studies of using DNA that trace the movement of our species over time. And all of the trails of, of our paths lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. We were born in Africa. And I can't wait to get invited by the Ku Klux Klan to give them a talk. <laughs> and tell these pointy-headed characters, we're all Africans! For 95% of our existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We understood that we were deeply embedded in and dependent on the natural world for our well-being and survival. Then 10,000 years ago, we discovered agriculture. The agricultural revolution changed the course of human history and we became farmers. And farmers understand very well that weather and climate affect our lives and our futures. They understand the amount of snow in the winter is related to how much moisture is there in the soil in the summer. They know that insects are vital for pollinating flowering plants. Certain species of plants take nitrogen from the air and make fertilizer in the soil. Farmers know that we are dependent on nature. But in only a hundred years now, we've shifted from being primarily concerned with farming to being big city dwellers. And in a big city, our primary focus becomes our jobs. And we forget that we're a part of a much bigger uh, system. And suddenly we've changed in our relationship with the earth, not only not seeing our dependence on nature, but our population has exploded. I was born in 1936. When I was born, there were just over two billion people on the planet. In my lifetime, the population has increased by more than 300%. That's unprecedented. Our population skyrocketing. At the same time, our technological power has exploded, and we now can probe to the depths of the earth up into the highest mountains. We can use whatever we want wherever we find it on the planet and we have been afflicted with an incredible appetite for stuff. We're no longer citizens with responsibilities. We're consumers. That's how we're seen by our governments. We're consumers. Our job is to keep the economy growing by consuming more stuff. And of course, we have a global economy now that exploits the entire planet for raw materials and dumps our wastes all over the world. And when you add that all up together, we have become a new kind of force on the planet. We're changing the chemical, the physical, and biological features of the planet on a geological scale. That's why the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Kurtzman, has called this the Anthropocene Epoch, the age of human beings, when we are altering the planet like ge a geological force. And we are undermining the life support systems of the world. And our problem now is, you know, we understand that we live within a world constrained by laws of science. In physics, we know the speed of light is the fastest we can go. We can't build a rocket going faster than that. We know the law of gravity. We know the law of entropy. It means you can't build a perpetual motion machine. We understand that. That's dictated by physics. In chemistry, we know there are diffusion constants and reaction rates and properties of atoms that dictate the kinds of reactions and molecules that we can synthesize. We know that. Chemistry tells us that. And in biology, we know. We know the fact that we are animals. And you know, I gave a speech in Austin, Texas a few years ago, and there were a lot of kids in the audience. I said, now if you remember one thing, kids, remember for my speech, remember we are animals. Man, did their parents get pissed off at me. <laughs> Don't call my daughter an animal, we're human beings. We, we forget that we are biological beings and as biological creatures, what is the most absolutely important, the most precious need that we have? The moment every one of us left our mother's body, we needed a breath of air. 
That breath was to inflate our lungs and announce that we have arrived. And from that moment on, 15 to 40 times a minute, we need air to the last breath we take before we die. And yet, we treat the atmosphere as a chemical dump to pour it in. We have a Prime Minister who has childhood asthma. Do you not think he'd understand what we put into the air has direct consequences for us? We need air. We need water. Every one of us is at least 70% water by weight. We are a big blob of water with enough organic thickener we don't dribble away on the floor. We, water is our, our most precious thing. And we, are, we need the earth because that's where our food comes from. Every bit of our food was once alive. And all of the energy in our bodies comes from photosynthesis. Plants capture sunlight, convert it into chemical energy that we then get by eating the plants or eating the animals that eat the plants. And finally, what keeps the planet habitable for us is the diverse array of living species on the planet. Those are our most fundamental needs for our very survival and our health. And they, and they are undeniable that science dictates us, dictates that. But what happens? We think that we, we are so smart now that we invent things like boundaries around borders, around our property, around our cities, our provinces, our country. We go to war, we will kill and die to protect those borders. But you know what? Nature doesn't give two hoots about borders. You know, we, you, I think of salmon in British Columbia, born in British Columbia streams, go through the Alaskan panhandle, up along Alaska to the coast of Japan. And the Japanese, the Alaskans, and the British Columbians all claim those are our fish. The fish don't give a damn about who they belong to. They do their thing. But boy, do we take those boundaries seriously. And then we create things like capitalism, economics, corporations, markets. My God, you'd swear these things were forces of nature. We invented the bloody things. You know, I was talking to Preston Manning a few years ago, and he seemed to be perfectly normal until I suddenly said, <laughs> We were having a good conversation, and then I said, well, you know, the market. The minute I said the market, he went, the market. Oh, the market. Free the market. Hallelujah, the market. Let the market. What the hell? We invented the goddamn thing. And yet we bow down before it as if somehow it holds the secret to the future of our society. This is crazy. We cannot change the laws of nature. The only thing we can change is the things that we invent. And look what happens in Copenhagen two and a half years ago. 192 countries trying to deal with the atmosphere that doesn't belong to anyone through the lenses of 192 national boundaries and 192 economic agendas. And we ask nature, we want to shoehorn nature into our economic and political agendas. It's suicidal. It can't work. Now let me over to to. to <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. An enviable task over the next ten city tour to vindicate economics in the eyes of David Suzuki, and I'll do my damn best. <laughs> You see, back in the early 1970s, after the first OPEC oil shock, President Nixon implemented the Emergency Energy Conservation Act, where he lowered the highway speed limits on interstate highways in the United States, a move that was pretty well paralleled around the world at the time. But when you change the price of oil as dramatically as we've seen over the last decade, when we go from a world of $20 a barrel to a world of $100 a barrel, we don't just change the speed at which we drive our cars. We, speed, we change the speed at which our economies can grow. Because for all of our efforts to wean ourselves off the fuel for the last 40 years, ever since the OPEC oil shocks, oil's still the single largest source of power for the global economy. And as a transit fuel, it has no substitute. A lot of things have changed since the early 1970s. My parents' furnace that used to be oil-fired is now natural gas-fired. Power-generating firms in North America don't burn oil to create power. They use natural gas. 
chemical companies use natural gas as a feedstock instead of oil. But there's one thing that we can't substitute natural gas for, and that's oil as a transit fuel. Because no matter how you move goods around the world, whether you move them by boat, by air, by rail, or by truck, you're burning one fuel and one fuel only. Now that's not, of course, the way our economic managers look at it in the models of the Bank of Canada or the Department of Finance or the Federal Reserve Board. Oil doesn't play any role. Our economy's growth limits determined by the availability of labor and capital. Yet if we step back and look at the history of our economy over the last 40 years, it's hard not to notice that every major global recession has oil's fingerprints all over it. The first OPEC oil shock, 1973, led to the deepest recession at that time. Six years later, the second OPEC oil shock led to the now infamous double dip recession. And in 1991, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and left half of its oil fields on fire, and oil spiked to the then unheard of price of $40 a barrel, lo and behold, once again, North America and Europe rolled over into recession. And of course, the last recession, following on the heels of $147 a barrel oil. But what's different today than what was in the past is no one has shut the spigot off. Today, 90 million barrels a day flow through the spigot, more than ever before. We're getting one and a half million barrels out of the tar sands, where 20 years ago, virtually nothing flowed out of the tar sands. The problem is, we can no longer afford what's flowing through the spigot. Peak oil isn't about what you can pump out of the ground. The world will never run out of oil in an absolute geological sense. Peak oil is about what your economy can afford to burn. Because if the price is needed to pull oil out of tar sands, if the price is needed to pull oil out of shale, out of the Orinoco heavy oil belt, or the deep sea, turns out to be more than your economy can afford to burn, then for all intent and purposes, it might as well be as if it doesn't exist at all. But that's not a message that we want to hear because what we're seeing today is that the minute the economy recovers, lo and behold, we're facing those same triple digit oil prices that put us in recession in the first place. So what do we do instead? We tell our governments to put the foot on the accelerator. We have zero interest rates. We have record budget deficits in our desperate pursuit of growth. But what we're finding, not just in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, even in China and India, the cheap money and huge budget deficits are not a substitute for affordable fuel. Well, they give us temporary stimulus, the costs they leave behind just make the adjustment that much more difficult. You know, there's major disconnects when the governor of the Bank of Canada keeps interest rates at zero and then warns you not to borrow. What's the whole point of keeping interest rates at zero if you're not supposed to borrow? But those are the contradictions that we have to stare ourselves in the face because our economy is no longer responding to that traditional stimulus. What we face is not another recession. Recessions are, by their very nature, temporary, ephemeral affairs, lasting several quarters. What we're facing is a permanent slowdown in the kind of growth rates that our economy can hum along at. And that's as true of the China and Indias of the world as it is for the Canadas and the United States of the world. Instead of trying to squeeze growth out of our economy, that's no longer possible. We have to learn to live within the context of slower growth. To many people, that's apocalyptic. And there's no doubt that it will have new challenges. But I think there's a couple of silver linings that we ought to be known of. First of all, in a world of triple-digit oil prices, distance costs money. The whole idea of a global economy where we produce something at one end of the world to take advantage of cheap labor rates, to sell it at distant markets at the other end of the world, that doesn't make any economic sense when oil costs $100 a barrel because what you'll save on labor costs 
go more than squander on bunker fuel. Who would have thought that triple digit oil will breathe new life into our hollowed out rust belt? But that's exactly what the transport costs will do in today's world. And perhaps our greatest benefit is going to be that in a world of triple digit oil prices, we won't have to rely on doing the right thing about carbon emissions. In 2009, U.S. emissions fell, not because of anything the Senate did, the waxman markey set climate change bill died on the Senate floor, not because of anything President Obama did, he shoved environmental concerns all the way to the back seat, if not to Trump, but because GDP didn't grow in the U.S. It fell, and U.S. emissions fell, and indeed global emissions fell. Now, environmentalists will point out that emissions rapidly recovered in the succeeding two years. But if that economic recovery is not sustainable, neither will that recovery be in emissions. I think whether we want it or not, we're going to find that a world of slower economic growth is going to lead us to a much greener world. Lastly, again, I don't have, think that slower economic growth has to be the apocalypse that most economists think it is. Of course, when we talk about slower GDP growth, we're talking about slower consumption growth, because what we consume is about three quarters of what we measure as GDP. Certainly, it's going to dictate a change in lifestyles, but as I say, I think we're going to find that there are benefits as well. That when we see triple digit oil prices, what we're really feeling is the boundaries of a finite world. And as they press against our economy, and indeed press against our lives, I think the key to the adjustment will be to recognize that in so many cases, making do with less is better than always wanting more. Thank you very much. the way the contempt we have for the other animals if you call someone a chicken or a pig or a snake or a worm or a or an ape you know we're insulting them because we somehow feel that we're uh, above them. i saw a sign at a calgary store years ago and it said no animals allowed and i told the i told the owner of the store if you enforce that you're not going to have customers <laughs> he didn't understand what the hell i was talking about he thought it was crazy Spoken like a true scientist. <laughs> oh, um, I'm, I'm curious about this because I'd love to think that we'd self-regulate ourselves out of carbon emissions or, or lesser than. But with what's happening right now in, in Ontario with the Ring of Fire, and it's going to be our tar sands, we're, we're, we're still building. We're still... I'm just wondering if you could address that. Well, if you're referring to the resource development in northern Ontario, which is called the Ring of Fire. It's, it's the same thing as going to Baffin Island for iron. It's the same thing as, you know, the tar sands is not a new discovery. I mean, the only thing new about it is it's a commercially viable source of supply. And the IEA said, the International Energy Agency says it's the third largest oil reserve in the world. That's only because of prices, okay? If prices fall, if we don't have economic growth and commodity prices fall, believe me, nobody's schlepping two tons of sand to make one barrel of oil. That's not economically viable. No one will be going up to northern Ontario for the ring of fire if base metal prices collapse because China and India are now growing at 2 to 3 percent. It's, it's not just carbon emissions. It's the whole issue of resource exploitation. You know, how many mines were cancelled? in the 2009 recession. They canceled $50 billion of capital spending in Fort McMurray, and not just in Fort McMurray, in the Fort McMurrays all around the world, whether it was Brazilian deep salt, whether it was shale, whether it was um, heavy oil in the Orinoco. So I think that the great, the great protector of the environment will be the absence of growth, because with a lot slower economic growth, we won't have the resource prices that will make the exploitation of those resources economically practical. Gentlemen, please, I'm actually speaking for education regarding carbon emission. 
am unable to understand the concept of coat trapping carbon somewhere below the earth so that on the surface of the earth there is not a lot of carbon or this exchange where people who don't emit a lot of carbon are giving money so that people who emit a lot of carbon can get credit even though they are still polluting the atmosphere. Well, I, 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 it is true, for the last six or seven years, I've been paying money, and I, it's just conscience money, to offset the uh, amount of emissions I give by traveling, or whether it's by car or plane or, or whatever. And what I do is I invest in gold-plated uh, uh, UN uh, monitored uh, investments in wind and solar in the developing world which wouldn't have been developed if it weren't for people like me investing in it. So, it's, it, but it, it, you're absolutely right. It doesn't reduce my carbon footprint, which has to be reduced. It's, I mean, I have to try to justify continuing to put out carbon uh, into the atmosphere. The really pernicious thing, though, is that we don't want to stop the way that we're doing things now. And so the only thing our government has invested serious money into is not renewables, is the, the federal government is invested in carbon capture, that is you burn it, you release it, and then you capture it and put it back in the ground. Because we know if you pump carbon dioxide into the ground, this is done routinely to try to get wells that are depleted, you can get more oil out by pumping carbon dioxide in the ground. And wow, it, the carbon dioxide doesn't come back out. So we have no idea what happened down there. Why is the carbon dioxide down there? Is it trapped under a, as a bubble under a, a limestone heading? Because if that's the case, the carbon dioxide dissolves in water as carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid will etch away the limestone and eventually be released anyway. What's the effect of pumping all that carbon into the ground when we now know there's more weight of living material under the ground than there is above the ground? These are organisms we don't know anything about. They go down 10 miles down in the ground. What do they, what do, they do for the transfer of uh, heat from the magma up through to the surface or the flow of water? We have no idea what they're doing. We're going to store millions of tons down in the soil. I asked one of the experts at Princeton, what's the effect of pumping carbon in, into the ground and leaving it there? And he said, I don't know, but the methanogens will love it. I said, what are they? He said, those are bacteria that, that take carbon dioxide and make it into methane, which is 22 times more potent to greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, you know? And so it's just a craziness. If we've invested billions of dollars in carbon capture and storage, well, guess what? Nature's already done it for us. That's what the tar sands are. The tar sands are carbon captured from the atmosphere, stored over millions and millions of years. It's crazy to somehow burn it, liberate it, and try to capture it and put it back down the ground. It should be left in the ground. And there is a country, Ecuador, a poor country in South America, that has discovered a massive pool of oil under their most treasured national park, Yasuni National Park. And the prime minister, who is an economist trained in the United States, said if we dig up that oil, it'll destroy the park, which is our pride and joy, and if we burn it, That'll create more cl climate change, so we're going to leave it in the ground. How about that? Hi. Uh, imaginary question for both of you, but if you could both be uh, transformed into Canada's Prime Minister and Finance Minister, what's the first three things you would do? Well, I know what I would do on the energy front. Uh, on the energy front, before blindly charging ahead to double tar sand production from one and a half million barrels a day to three, I'd insist that we get the full value for what we're already digging out the ground. Because we're not. Where we're sending our oil to Cushing, Oklahoma, we're losing about $20 a barrel. That is a bigger ripoff of Alberta producers than the so-called made in Canada prices during the National Energy Program in the early 1980s. Instead of building more pipelines, maybe we need more refineries. That maybe instead of the Herald Staple, you know, 
you are the wa drawers of water, you are the wood, we get full value out of the resource before just digging up more and selling it either to the U.S. or China as raw bitumen. I'm not running for political office. <laughs> David, I think we need your... Well, I, I, would put a, I would put an absolute freeze on any development of natural systems anywhere in the country. Just freeze it. We're one species out of maybe 30 million species on the planet, and we think we can take over 90% of the Earth for us, and when we do that, we drive other species to existence. I believe that our greatest treasure right now is any forests, any wetlands, any natural systems. We've got to protect them at all costs. We've now got to put barriers on where human encroachment on, on nature goes on. For our own well-being and survival, we've got to do this. I would stop any further development in the tar sands and shut it down right now. And I would get us on a massive program of, of renewable uh, energy, solar, wind, geothermal, and this will, believe me, will create far more jobs than will the fossil fuel industry and get us on to a brighter, cleaner future. to be seeing you here. Where are you? I'm right here. <laughs> I watched your like shows, Nature of Things, since I was like a little kid, and to see you here today for like the first time ever is like a huge joy and honor. And here's um, here's my question to, to you. So as we know, like the oil industry is like basically the number one um, resource on the planet. But we all know the oil will be eventually die in the future. You, you can see in Dubai even, the oils are even slowly depreciating. Here's my question to you. Since I am going to be getting a car in the future, is it um, possible to be having a source of fuel that can um, have maintain their, maintain their economic growth while at the same time um, being environmentally friendly? Because I heard about biofuel and all these other stuff like hybrid cars, but which do you think will be growing in the future? I, I really don't know. I hope you won't hunger for a car when you become an adult. But I'll tell you the best fuel, it's called muscles. And, you know, I, I really believe that what this globalization has been an absolutely destructive concept. And uh, we've got to be much more self-sufficient, much more of a local animal, the way we have been for 99% of our existence. So yeah, you know, a, a, a vehicle, a private car is something I think in the long run, it just, it's all made out of stuff coming from the earth. But the, let me tell you that I was in Germany at the Potsdam Institute where they have a plan for 100% renewable uh, clean energy in their grid, their electrical grid. And the problem we have is that wind and doesn't blow 24 hours a day. The sun only shines eight or nine hours a day so that you've got long periods where you don't have a supply of electricity. And cars in their plan are gonna play a critical role. Every car they say should be electric. So the batteries allow you to store the electricity so that what you do is, you know when you have, a, if you have an electric toothbrush? What is yeah, if you have an electric toothbrush, you don't plug it in, right, when you want to recharge it. You just put it into a, a holder, and by induction, you charge the battery. So the cars in Germany are proposed to park in their parking spots over an induction coil. So when there's plenty of energy, that energy will charge the batteries of all the cars. When there's a shortage of energy, every parked car and its battery will be a storage of electricity that it will give back into the grid. So the big challenge now is how do you monitor that so you know whether you have to pay money for the charging or whether you've given back enough and you have to get paid or recompensate. So the car in their system is a critical part, but they have to be electric. All right, I think I'm gonna have to close things off. I'm really sorry, I know a lot of you had questions, but uh, we do have other guests waiting to come on stage. Big thank you to Dave.
head over there and get your book signed by them. Thanks so much.